Hey guys, it's Ollie from Rad Season. I'm stoked to be joined today by adventure traveler, YouTuber, BBC TV host, and founder of Fearless and Far, Mike Corey. Mike, thanks for coming on the show, man. Hey, man, my pleasure. Good to be here. Good stuff. Whereabouts are you, Mike? You're over in Romania at the moment, is that right? In Cluj, Napoca, Romania. So the second biggest city here in Romania is Eastern Europe. I had never been here before, actually. Um, the year's been a bit crazy for us all with travel-wise, and as of July 2nd, Canadians were allowed to travel to the EU, so I think a few days later, July 5th, I was out of there and over to the, into the EU. So I've been bouncing around here at Poland, a bit of Germany, and now, and I've been in Romania now for about two and a half months now. Wow, and w when, when you left in July, like, like what, was the, what, what was the procedure with that? I mean, did you have to apply for, for all kinds of visas, or was it just... Yeah, well, my COVID story, I think we all have an interesting one, but actually I was in a tent in Yemen <laughs> in, uh, on Socotra Island, which is this beautiful endemic jewel. Like all of the species there are only found, well, not all, but a lot of the species are only found there. The dragon blood tree, when you cut it, it bleeds red sap, all these interesting creatures. And I was in a tent, there's no reception. It was the first few days of March and I get a scratch in my tent at 3 a.m. saying, the flight that I had booked in two weeks from them was actually canceled and it was rescheduled for three hours from now, again, it being 3 a.m. And I had to get on that or not. And I, if I didn't, I'd be stuck there for months, well, indefinitely, right, because of the, the, the pandemic. So I, from a tent in, in Yemen back to Canada, the, the freezer, because it's freezing on the east coast of Canada, where I'm from, New Brunswick in, in, uh, in uh, that time of year. And then from there, so yeah, I spent um, you know, the quiet time we all did earlier this year, kind of collecting our thoughts and seeing the world unravel. And then as of July 2nd, Canadians were allowed to go to the EU without visa and without quarantine. So I uh, had a decision to make as a travel influencer. Do I go? Do I not go? And if I do choose to go, do I post about it or do I not post about it? So I did choose to go and I did choose to post about it, talking about the experience. I made a vlog of what it was like traveling at that time, discussing why I chose to do it, some of the extra precautions I was taking, the ethics and morals of traveling during a pandemic, all these different things. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. the government had opened the countries to some, some other countries, like the tourism was allowed in the EU for Australians, Canadians. Canadians and, and a handful of others. So I took advantage of the opportunity and I've been traveling here ever since. So it's been since July, right? And it's um, almost November now. So it's been a few months for sure. Wow. And what, like, I'd love to take it back to the beginning. I mean, like what, when, when, you, were, when you were younger, how, how, did, how did you get the travel bug? I mean, was it always something that you wanted to kind of go out and explore all these places or? Mm. I, I no, actually, uh, but I was always a curious kid. And the story that my my mom always embarrassingly tells my friends and <laughs> and girlfriends or whoever who comes home is that I was always the kid that was flipping over the rocks. You'd take me for a walk around the block, and I'd be flipping over every log and concrete piece and whatever, looking for spiders and salamanders or whatever else. I always thought these things are really cool. I don't know where it came from. They don't know where it came from, but dissecting it now all these years later i think i just really liked the fact that there's lots of things in this world that are misunderstood so snakes and spiders and slugs they're icky and gross and scary but actually if you take you know at some time and watch a documentary or read a book or you know go on wikipedia you can learn some pretty cool things about them and you realize that they're not dangerous they're not gross they're just you know, they're misunderstood and the world is like that too. And that reflects my travel style now is I really enjoy going to these countries that are deeply misunderstood. I lived in Mexico City for two and a half years because I loved it so much. I last year was in Turkmenistan and Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Mauritania, Bangladesh, all these countries that aren't exactly on the tourist map for the very same reason. A lot of things in life we're scared of, we just don't understand. It's just a lack of knowledge. Uh, and once you dig into them, you're like, oh, actually, everything I know about this this thing, this animal, this country is kind of wrong. And it's only the, the bad data points I hear about. And so as a curious kid, uh, travel just kind of naturally, naturally appealed to me. Um, but I came from a big family. I had three siblings. And we had this big camper van and we'd go to you know the, the, the forest and camp. And my parents actually did take us to Boston one year for um, for uh, Independence Day. And we did go to Iceland once, which was really cool. Um, I'm from the East Coast, so it's not too far of a jump. And those mm -hmm. things were really fascinating. 
for me, I always want to try to find the animals. <laughs> All the animals I, I read about in the books and saw in the movies were like my celebrities. <laughs> so I was always looking for like the chameleons and penguins or whatever was around. Maybe no penguins in Iceland, but you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so then when, the, my, but thing I, I was, my, my journey with fear is, is interesting. It ties a lot into my travel story too, because I was not an outgoing, you know, extroverted guy. Like maybe some might think I am now. I was a shy guy with a, a literally a phobia of public speaking. I don't think anybody will ever understand besides myself how scared I was of public speaking because people don't believe it now seeing who I am. But, uh, you know, I was just a shy guy who hated the spotlight. I had some traumatic stuff happen in a classroom where I was ridiculed in front of all my peers in grade four, and that sticks with you, you know what I mean? And so mm. I was not the kind of guy that was going to go start pushing boundaries and, and, you know, like skydiving and, you know, going solo traveling. That was, that was not me at all. But it's funny, when life hits you with a couple punches, uh, you do some crazy things sometimes. So I was graduating with biology degree in my hometown university, there was um, uh, an opportunity to travel to Indonesia to be a research assistant, to, to, to scuba dive three times a day and help some scientists with their research. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I should do it. And then there was a, a car crash where I destroyed my car. I had a bad breakup and I had a, a close family member die, my, my grandfather. And I was just on the on the, the fence. Like I, I never had things of that magnitude happen before. And it was just one, two, three. And I, I was just felt lost. And, um, and then I had a friend and we're like, yeah, man, let's do it together. Let's go travel. And then the day came to pay the deposit. <laughs> and uh, I went to go pay and he's like, yeah, I'll, we will meet in the pub after. So I go to the pub and have a pint. And uh, then like an hour goes by, two hours go, goes by and I get that text. It's like, bro, couldn't get the money together. Uh, I'm sorry. And then, so I booked myself into a one, like a, a three month trip to the other side of the world with no friends, with nobody. And I was so absolutely petrified. And I remember getting on that plane and just thinking I was never going to see my family again. And so I fly over to Indonesia. We're in Wakatobi. It's not Bali. Wakatobi is like a series of islands off an island, off an island, off an island. 36-hour boat ride from the nearest big city. And uh, we were there. There was no mirrors, no running water. We ate rice three meals a day. And it was awesome. It was awesome. It was the best experience of my life, but I was so absolutely terrified uh, This until I got there. And I met all these other absolutely terrified kids. <laughs> and we all, we all shared this together and we all became instant friends, closer friends than people that I'd met, you know, when I was a kid and I'd known my entire life. You just bond so easily with some of these people with shared experiences or just share, shared worldviews. And I realized that fear is not something that that you should listen to often. It doesn't, it, it tries to give you advice, but often it, it's a liar. It doesn't know wh what it's doing. It, it, people often as well try to give you advice and it's really just their fears that they're trying to put on you and no one really knows anything about it. You have maybe a couple data points you heard on the news of some terrible event, mm -hmm. but you actually don't know what it's like. And for me coming from a small town, I didn't have anyone to talk to who was a traveler because everyone who was a traveler wasn't there. They left. They're traveling, of course. And so everyone around me didn't know anything about travel. And my, my family was always very supportive. But I had some friends that told me not to go. Uh, and I, anyway, I did. Uh, because, again, I was I was against the, the rails um, because the life was, was not playing very nicely. But it was one of the best things that ever happened. Um, despite that disaster, it got me out there and realized that my curiosity that I had as a kid – there's a whole big world out there, not just my backyard, filled with creatures and events and festivals, especially in cultural uh, cultures that I could never even dream of. That's that seem like they're from movies, places and places that seem like they're fantasy. All exist on this planet. So I've been a kid in the, in the candy shop ever since. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and and when like after that first trip to Indonesia and seeing all those things, did that sort of then spark um, an interest in in off the beaten path? not just places, but experiences as well. Was that something that happened? Or were you like, I just want to experience it all, really? No, well, um, I, I was, see, the, the special thing about that trip, besides it being my first solo trip, kind of by accident, kind of like pushed into it <laughs> um, by life and fate, uh, the, the thing that resonated with me the most is I was never a kid that felt like I fit in. 
And I got there and on the day, on day one, everyone's there with their, you know, their nails all pretty and their nice shirt and their hair gelled and, you know, and then you, but you're in, you're on a beach. There's no running water. There's no mirrors. You're scuba diving three times a day. You're getting bit scratched and you, 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 you turn into a mess. But the thing is all the people who had put so much work into their exterior self that all faded away. There was no way to maintain it. And so what was in the inside ended up being who you were, not were not who you are on the yeah. outside. And you saw these like, you know, beautiful guys and girls on day one and day two, um, just, you know, be a, like just a bottom of the totem pole after a week or two. And the people who had put the work on the inside of themselves, you know, read books and played music and new jokes and magic trips. Those are the ones that became like the, the cool kids. Not that there was like a hierarchy per se, but, they were the ones that, that made the biggest impression. And it made me realize that while we live in this world where external appearance is very important, you know, you can't walk around in the modern world and, and look like a hobo um, and be successful or, or be, be, I mean, you can argue whether you be happy or not, but at the end of the day, it's important for, for most people. But in a place like that, it, you, you see where the true value was. And for me, I perpetually was search, in a search for those experiences, which led to this travel style of always trying to find challenges and you know strange experiences and 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 <laughs> events and and festivals or whatever to make myself uncomfortable because again i saw what that does to people and myself and it makes you grow and it makes you have a, a, a skill set that is so valuable in this world which is flexibility and resourcefulness and just like fun man anybody who's a traveler like yourself and everybody Everybody listen to this podcast. You know when you when you meet a fellow traveler, what that is that purity, that that just freedom, that open mind that we all share, and it's from being in situations like that where you're out of control, or you're not exactly sure what's happening, or you got to sleep on a concrete floor, or in the back of a chicken bus, and you got some baby on your lap and a you know a, a case of diarrhea or something. You know, like that you get you get bulletproof, and that's a badge that you that you meet that you see very clearly on people who, who have been through it. And that's why you can connect so easily with some of these people immediately, opposed to yeah. people you've known your entire life back in your hometown that um, that you don't, you feel like two different people, you know, even if it's been 20 years since you've known them. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And and then, I mean, like, like after, um, like, like after being there and doing like, like and, and doing the, uh, doing, doing the conservation work, what, what, what was the next step? So, so you were like, like, did, did you want to go home, like back to Canada or you thought, okay, like, I just want to kind of, I, I want to go somewhere else and, and explore different yeah, places. Yeah, I, I, I was broke. <laughs> I was so broke. So I did go back home and I was in the cycle for a few years, which was uh, working enough to travel, then traveling and then back kind of the cycle. Yeah. And uh, I never really made it work like on the road. It's kind of hard in the beginning to uh, to be able to you know get that perpetual travel uh, entrepreneur make money while you work thing. Um, I was couch surfing a lot. I was made, I was trying to stretch as much as I could. But in the day, my money ran out. But how I got into the video again because it, it, it wasn't just travel that made me all of a sudden pick up a camera and uh, and start to, to fight my greatest fear is. I realized that that the the modern the 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 path that that had been laid out for me was interesting, but it wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. I had found people that heavily influenced my life in the far corners of the world, and I realized that the path that I that I had before that, which I didn't feel like I was part of, now definitely wasn't wasn't for me because I met my family, uh, my my like my, my brothers and sisters on on the road. Um, and so for me, it was it was a very enlightening thing. And so I kept on wanting to travel because I, I, I saw myself growing more and more. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew the person that I was back uh, back at home wasn't the wasn't the true me. And so I was trying to tease out the guy that was hidden deep underneath there after you know twenty five years or so of, of just uh, being stuck, feeling stuck. You know, not every day was stuck, but it just didn't feel like I was at my true potential. And how I got making videos was I was doing a dive master internship for um, scuba diving in U- Utila in Honduras. There's two islands above Honduras. Utila is like the party island, but also a good spot for diving. And I, this is kind of a gross story, so pardon it. But I was, long story short, I hit my toe. It's, it was a spot where you don't have to wear shoes. I didn't wear shoes for three months. The last week there, I hit my toe on something and it got infected. Ended up going back home. 
and ended up being flesh eating disease and MRSA, which are two things that are bad individually. And together it made my toe melt. And that put me on a couch for four months. I couldn't even get out of bed for half of it because just the pressure of sitting up was so bad. And again, got me into this crazy mindset of like doing things that were uncharacteristic. And I had a friend of mine and God bless the guy who said, Hey man, you like to travel? Here's a travel video competition. And I was I ah, don't do that. Oh God, I got to get it. I'm not good on camera. And he's like, Oh, come on. Like, what are you going to do? Sit on the couch for four more months. And, uh, and so I did it. And I remember doing like 40, 47 takes of my name. And then, you know, just being so frustrated. And like, you try to say your name, like, hi, I'm Mugga. Hi, I'm Mike Cole Coco. And you just can't, you can't, you can't do it. And you don't know why you can't do it, but you just can't. And then you get flustered and it's even harder. And then you do 47 takes and of that. And then you do 22 takes the next one. And then 50 takes the next scene. You take the best all together. You put it online and people are like, oh my God, you're a natural. And you're like, yeah, natural. Okay. <laughs> you don't see the, the hundreds of, of behind the scenes of me almost weeping because I can't say my name right, but I'm a natural. All right, sure. Anyway, and then so that's what it was. And then I, 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 for some reason, was ascended to the semifinals of this travel competition. And I couldn't believe it either because I'm not looking, I wasn't good at it. I just knew what looked good because we all watch movies and we all watch TV and we all watch at that point, YouTube is still like beginning. So you can see some people who are doing it well. And I just did it enough times until it looked 50% of what that was. And apparently that was good enough <laughs> to get the semifinals. Uh, and then, so that was a bit encouraging. And then I just bashed at it again and again and again and again, and I entered all these competitions and again, suffered and pushed myself. Uh, but then and that was it. And then I realized, oh my God, if it, like you, you have a problem. So take public speaking classes. And I remember being so scared of going to public speaking classes because you have to present on the first day. And I was just like blackout terrified. And then I survived. I don't know how, but hey, I, I survived. And so I went back for the second one and I survived that. And then I realized, what am I so scared about anyway? You know, like, I don't know these people. They don't know me. I'm here. I'm a person. We're all human. We're all just trying to make our way through life with all these different complications and childhood upsets and, ah, you know, and then I realized, what's the big deal? And then I realized fear is not something that I was going to let control my life anymore. So I, I've stopped and, that, and that's why I made the channel and that's why I do this travel style. I find the experiences that I'm scared of and I find the things that make me uncomfortable and I jump in, not confidently. I mean, I look confident, not fearlessly. I mean, I might look fearless, but I've realized that fearless is just the action. People can act fearless, but everyone feels the fear. Even if you're a pop star or a bungee jump or a skydiver, you still feel fear. It's not like people don't feel it. The difference is people still feel it and do it. I mean, Call those people fearless. So I've chosen to be fearless because it's a choice, not because I don't feel it. And that was the big secret that unlocked a, a whole different avenue of life for me. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there's so many things that are included in that. I mean, like you've been to some incredible festivals and that, that was that was pretty much how, how I found out about you. I was like, okay, who, who's this guy who's, who's filming like Battle of the Oranges over, over, in, over in Italy and then the exploding kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah. and all this stuff that we like, uh, uh, like you know, these they're unique things that only happen. Like you, you can't really replicate these these kind of events or these things anywhere in the world, right? They're just sort of like right. bespoke to that one little region of that town. I mean, um, did you sort of when you were seeking these things? Did you go out like? How, how did you try and find out about them? Did you sort of like? Was it a word of mouth thing or? <clears throat> Yeah, good question. I So again, I've always been interested in the things that are misunderstood. So again, that in the beginning, that was insects and arachnids and reptiles and things. And then so whenever they pop up on my radar, I, I always recorded them as far as these travel experiences go. So I have a big, um, it's called Google, there's Google Maps and there's Google My Maps. And on Google My Maps, you can create your own maps with hints and everything. And so I have this giant My Maps uh, of everything I've come across over the past 10 years. So if it pops up on Instagram or YouTube or on Pinterest or wherever else, I'll, I'll re often, sometimes reverse image search to find if anybody's can, has ever shared the location. Cause often it's just like, you know, those influencers post the, the photo, but not actually the location or they're reposted over and over. But if you were do a reverse image search, you, have, you can sometimes find 
where these things are. Um, yeah. But often you have to just hear about them. So like, for example, the Exploding Hammer Festival, there was no, there was one YouTube video of like a shaky handheld camera from a local guy. Mm -hmm. And originally I had found out a bit about it because I had a, um, I was go, I was typing like crazy festivals, like um, in uh, Fiestas uh, Locas or something in Spanish. Because yeah. again, if you search things in the local languages, sometimes you'll, you'll find local results because hey, if they're really, really, really specific, esoteric, hidden, they're not going to be in English sometimes, but if they're in English, they've been kind of discovered by that, by that point. So I, I often look, look for things in the native languages and you can find things sometimes. I mean, Google Translate itself is built into the browser, right? And, I, and sometimes as well, I, I'll hire a researcher in, in the country. So I was in Bangladesh uh, last, this year, earlier this year. God, it feels like the longest year ever. And um, I had him go through some blog posts and different things to find special things in Bangladesh in the local language and make phone calls and all this. So that, that's, you can find people on Upwork is a great site for that. Or Couchsurfing, you can, you can meet people there that'll help you out as well. Yeah. So for me, it, it's, I'm always, my, my antenna are always tuned to, to find these things. And again, like for, for the Exploding Hammer Festival, that was the first piece of YouTube content that was there. I don't want to say I'm the first foreigner that was there, um, but definitely the first YouTuber that was there. I think at one point there was, when I was there, actually the BBC were there as well um, from a distance film, filming on a telephoto lens because they couldn't have their um, health and safety department probably sign off for their present to get any closer than like 100 meters away because it was dangerous man i saw a guy lose a thumb it was crazy uh oh, really? and wow. i got to try and i yeah but you you really had to watch it because so it's for people who aren't familiar with it, it was probably most people it was uh saint it was john the baptist it was john the baptist day uh, and they just call it uh um yeah no they call it carnival that's the name of it just carnival mm -hmm. like carnival uh, except for during Carnival, originally they would they would light off fireworks going down the streets of this this small um, town called San Juan de la Vega, and eventually, like yeah, you know, fireworks, fireworks. Then someone one day put explosives on a hammer and were slamming the hammers because they make a big boom and a big sound to celebrate John the Baptist, and they were breaking car windows and breaking buildings with the explosions and the pebbles flying everywhere. So like, okay, we have to stop this, not the hammers, just going down the road <laughs> so so they moved the festival to like a a field of sharp loose rock <laughs> which is the worst place to have an exploding hammer festival and they put like a couple layers of metal down and they put this homemade i mean you, i think you go to home hardware or home depot and you mix a couple chemicals together and you have this impact explosive so if you try to light it it doesn't actually light but the second you hit it the impact actually causes a massive explosion massive shockwave there's no fire, but there's a huge explosion, like a shockwave explosion. So much so when they slam it into this, this field of like loose rock, the hammers can go 10 meters in the air, boom, 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 and they just spin off. And everyone has to run and, and they laugh. I, oh my God. And it'd be easier if there was just one hammer circle, but there was five or six hammer circles. So at any time, any of those circles, a hammer could launch off and be spinning in the air. And so I'm here trying to film it, focused on the shot, but you can't focus on the shot because you have to be aware all directions all the time. And people got hurt there, man. I, the year before, they were saying someone um, lost their arm. Uh, I saw someone lo lose their thumb, and the paramedics were all there with the ambulances lined up. Uh, also, a guy. A very common thing is people getting uh, ruptured eardrums because again, yeah. you can see this this shock wave in slow motion just ripple across the the field. It's, it's really powerful, uh, the, these explosions. And, um, but they do it, and it's so funny, like uh, it starts off quite, quite relaxed where they all put on a few little, they're like little packets, almost the size of charcoal briquettes. And then it starts with like one or two, then it eventually like, works up to like 10 or 15. And you have all these like young guys that are 15 or something, all like smashing these mass explosions. And then you have all these like girls who are like with the crop tops and like, you know, the, the ladies out and the, the skinny, skinny skirts. And they're all like on the side, like waving to the boys as they just slam the hammers in. <laughs> I, I've never experienced anything like it, but uh, it was really cool to be there and, and to participate. So I made a YouTube video about it. It's uh, it's online. All you have to search is Exploding Hammer Festival. And we I was there with, um, I had the local tourism board for like a small town nearby help and help make it happen and get a contact to, to, to see behind the scenes and stuff. 
And she absolutely refused for us to try. However, <laughs> I had I had to try. I had to try. You got it. So uh, one of the yeah, so one of the guys uh, put like a couple of these little briquettes on, like only two, and some of these guys are doing like fifteen. And so I smashed two with a small little dinky hammer, and it it was rough, even just with two of these little things. I couldn't imagine what it was like to have fifteen or more. Oh my god! Like these guys uh, again, the ruptured eardrums. A lot of them just have Kleenex balled up and shoved in their ears. And that's supposed to protect you. I had like, you know, industrial grade earplugs and still like my ears were ringing after. Like, oh God, those guys are crazy. Well, that's why I love Mexico. That's why I lived in Mexico City for two and a half years because there's all kinds of stuff like that. As well as there's, um, uh, so the, you know, the bulls of fire, sorry, the bull, the um, running of the bulls in Spain where, mm-hmm. you know, you run and the bulls follow. So Mexico's taken that to an even more extreme level, if you can believe that. So They've taken this idea of running from the bulls and they've removed the bulls, which you might think is a good thing, but they've added paper mache, firework filled, steel rebar enforced car sized bulls that they light on fire as they're exploding and they chase you down the street. And it's not just one, it can be two, it can be three. And so you're at night, everyone's wasted trying to dodge these giant bulls being pushed by all these drunk men shooting basically model rocket engines at you from every direction, getting stuck in your shirts, burning your skin. That was, it was insane. Um, also in Mexico, also I made a YouTube video about that. And that was one of, I mean, I've done a lot of wild festivals and, and someone called crazy things that, that was one of the crazy things that, that was one of the, I felt I was in danger that night. Um, but I got some great footage. <laughs> And would you say, uh, I mean, doing this, like, we're coming up to almost 10 years. I mean, are those kind of two standout crazy events or crazy experiences? Or, you know, have you had, like, other things happen that are kind of on that level as well? As far as as festivals go, um, the Exploding Hammer Festival, the Bulls of Fire Festival, the Orange Fight, which is in Italy uh, as well, was, was one that was very intense. Uh, so also I did La Tomatina, uh, you know, the tomato fight in Spain, the orange fight in Italy, in Ivrea makes the, makes the tomato fight look like a kindergarten. The tomato fights like one hour, you have like tomatoes, which are kind of soft and then it's over and there's lots of people, right? It's crowded. The more dangerous thing is, is more like a stampede and, and claustrophobia opposed to anything else. It doesn't, it's not fun to get hit in the face of the tomato, but you know, it's less fun getting hit in the face of the freaking orange, man. And those guys do four hours a day for five days, constant battle. And so you you go there and you see guys, bloody noses, like bruises all over their face, cuts, and they they, they take it's a it's a war. It is a it is a, a war. And so people leave like like they've gone to war. People also get d- detached uh, retinas, I think, because you get an orange to the socket of your eyeball. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not the same format. The Battle of the Orange. It's Battle of the Tomatoes. The Tomato Fight. La Tomatina. There's big dump trucks that come and they. The dump trucks like dump the tomatoes and there's people who throw the tomatoes. But it's everyone versus yeah. everyone. Whereas the Orange Fight is there's. There's a whole story behind it where there was this tyrannical king and he was an asshole and um, you're so you're fighting his guards. These guys who come up in these big like chariots filled with <laughs> filled with like. Uh, some they have some oranges, but they've got armor. They've got these big face masks, and so you're fighting against these guys who are armored. They're the king's men, right? And so there's all of these boxes of oranges all around. And you just whip oranges at um, at the king's men, and but of course you miss, and then they fly over, or they fly under, and you, you're not. I mean, people don't have laser precision when they're throwing oranges, and so you, there's a lot of collateral damage. And orange juice isn't fun in the eyes either. So um, I I. I was scared. <laughs> I was. I was. I got hit in the face a couple times. Not hard, but you take an orange to the, to the eye socket, man, and you're 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 ready to wrap it for a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, that was I, a fun I, one. Um, and you you can't. You're 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 considered. Uh, you're if you couldn't go to it and wear any safety equipment. Like they there are there are some men there that that are warriors, and if you show up with a like a safety mask. You're going to get booed, or anyway, it's a, it's a display of strength and resilience that festival. So, for for all of the festivals I've been to, those are are some of the wildest. But besides that, I, I've gone to the Amazon rainforest. 
I, I um, found a shaman in the middle of the woods and we did a, a ritual called Kambo where they burn frog venom. So they burn scars into your skin. They peel off the skin and they, they rub frog venom in to your skin. You have a severe allergic reaction for 15 minutes. And then what they say is that your immune system is boosted to godly levels. You can see better, smell better, hear better. Uh, all your senses are all heightened and Amazon warriors, we do this before hunting and also before going to battle. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's a cleansing ritual, but also a, it's supposed to sharpen your senses. And so we went in the middle of nowhere in the Amazon, because again, how do you find these authentic experiences, right? You can't just go on Google and say, you know, authentic, shaman experience because Mr. Shaman doesn't have an Instagram page or a, or a you know, trip advisor or whatever, a Yelp review. So you have to kind of show up and ask around and try to fill up the situation to have like the really true authentic experience. And so that one was, that one was crazy too. Um, that was a hell, a hell of a time for sure. Uh, a lot of throwing up, not by me, um, but my, I was with a friend. I, I was right on the verge of throwing up, but I was able to record it all on GoPro, which proved some pretty shocking footage <laughs> and, and what would you say with these experiences i mean they, they would be part of like like is it volunteering hardship so sort of <clears throat> getting out of your comfort zone and then i guess becoming more kind of comfortable with these with these type of things totally there's definitely elements of stoicism in a lot of what i do because i really firmly believe that if you put yourself voluntarily through little hells um when life comes knocking with its own little hells or big hells you'll be more resilient and will be able to act more with logic and and less emotion right and mm -hmm. so even some silly challenges i did like um earlier this year i buried myself in in sand up to my neck for 24 hours <laughs> which might seem like you know a, a you know some silly crazy thing but dude it was it was hard i knew it was going to be hard but I also knew I was going to be safe. Um, and a lot of these things I do, I, I really, people who, who travel with me, who are close to me, know that I really go above and beyond to make sure these things are as safe as possible for myself. I, I really put the research and time into training for them, to researching them, to thinking about all the details. Another premise is fear setting. So like visualizing the worst experience, not as like a dread, like, oh my God, but like realistically, let's say this was going to happen. These are the problems I need to think about and then preparing accordingly, not expecting them to happen, but then not being surprised if you do find yourself in one of these rare occurrences as well. So, but voluntary hardship is, is exactly, exactly it, right? It, 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 again, putting yourself through these things so you become comfortable being uncomfortable. And then once you're comfortable being uncomfortable, there's really not much that can hold you back in life. Yeah. You know, I really believe that. And if, if you had like one piece of advice with someone that was, yeah, either in, in one of these situations or, or was looking to kind of, I don't know, just experience some, some different like, like forms of travel, what, what would it be? Well, I guess I, I, I found myself in a situation where I've done a lot of interesting things. And one thing I still, um, want people to know is that you show up in a place there's a pamphlet of activities there's a waterfall experience there's a zip line and there's like a safari you can very easily go to that company and say is there any more waterfalls or hey i'm looking for like this kind of i'd, lo I'd love to go stay with a local villager you know mm -hmm. is do you know anybody listen i'll sleep on the floor i don't need a five-star accommodations actually a really funny story <laughs> i uh this video is not posted yet, but it will be soon. I, I live with a, a tribe in Namibia. So there's this really amazing tribe called the Himba in northern Namibia, which is in uh, like southwest Africa, right above South Africa. And the women still dress traditionally where they have like these beautiful clay covered dreadlocks. They cover them, cover themselves in like butter and, and uh, ochre, like a, like a red powder. They think um, ankles are the most like forbidden sexy part of the body. So they have their boobs out, no problem because who cares about boobs? Apparently ankles are where it's at. And they still live in cow dung huts. And I wanted to go like really see what it was like, but not just show up for an hour and leave, like really try to make a bit of a relationship and help and help how I could and and just experience it. And so I I'm, I'm, have this local contact uh, who usually organizes experiences. And I was like, hey, I'd love to go stay with the Himba people for 48 hours. And they're like, oh, uh, you know, well, well, we can do it for a couple hours. I'm like, no, I want to stay for 48. And he's like, no, well, it's impossible. And I said, why, why is it impossible? It was, oh, it, it, you just can't do it. And I was like, well, why can't I do it exactly? Is there, 
is there a, like a rule or is it is it just like intrusive like no there's where are you going to sleep and i said i'll sleep with i'll sleep with them i'll sleep in, in a hut like no you can't sleep in the hut like well why well there's no there's no toilet they they don't have like it's, there's no bed it's like i know that's why i want to do it <laughs> and so we had to go back and forth for like five minutes for him to understand that i wanted to sleep on the cow skin rug with the wooden pillow that's traditional of himba and it just it just broke his brain <laughs> because normally the tourists go and they just want to just hang out for an an hour and then they buy a couple souvenirs and leave where I wanted to, to live with them. And I've realized that this is something you can do anywhere in the world, no matter where you are, you have a local contact and you just keep on prying. You often have to pay a little bit more because it's a private experience, um, not a group experience, but you yeah. can find some really cool ideas. I mean, everybody in a country knows local people. Um, and then it's just a matter of you know, uh, making a friend who can help you out or paying a bit more to help you out. You don't have to ever take what's on the pamphlet. The pamphlet's a good, a good like idea of what's around, but you can take that same contact and craft something custom and have a very beautiful authentic experience where it's just you. Again, um, the, the cheaper way to do that is even like something through couch surfing. For the longest time, I found contacts through couch surfing. Um, mm -hmm. I would, I would, I would go to a place that's crashed on a couch. And the beautiful thing about that is you can make instant friends and all you need for a country or a city is to have a local friend and they can unlock so much for you. You know what I mean? And you don't even have to necessarily stay on someone's couch if it's not for you. I always recommend it. Um, but, but you can still couch surfing meetups. You can still say, message someone on that platform and say, Hey, look, I'm in town for a couple nights. I'll buy you a beer and dinner let's go out um i'd love to talk about travel and often you can have these people go out with you i mean there's, and there's, there's a review system you can see references on the platform as well i've been saying coach surfing for years man I, and a lot of us true travelers have because we all understand that the most powerful thing in travel is is local connections and it's not always yeah. it's not the landscapes you remember it's always meeting that that old guy who sells the sheep cheese behind the barn in Romania, or it's the, the guy playing crokinole in Turkey who invites you to have a cigar. You know, like those are the memories that really, really last, um, that mean the most, not, not necessarily seeing a beautiful thing. That's always great, but it's the human connection that always, always is, is the most beautiful thing about travel. And so now during COVID, it's a little more difficult, uh, but moving forward, that's a really, a really, really important thing that I think everyone should know is if you're out there traveling, you can, you can order off menu. You don't have to stick yeah. to what's available on, on, on the pamphlet. Yeah, that's cool, man. And what, um, with, with COVID and everything happening now, uh, have you got any projects coming up later this year or, you know, in, in, into the new year? Yeah. So I am actually, I just got back a couple nights ago talking about like, um, creating your own adventures so i had always this fantasy of uh, camping in an abandoned castle um and the fantasy was hilltop middle of nowhere some crumbling tower big orange tent pitched in the middle campfire and just staying there and so i, I after poking around online again typing in abandoned castle in the romanian language into google and Google Maps, I was able to find a selection to then find my dream castle. So I actually just a couple nights ago hiked like 45 minutes up to the top of this hill and uh, pitched a tent in the middle of an abandoned castle, and it was incredible. The night before, as I was reading up some final information, there was a little note by um, a local, uh, like a local blog, saying, "Oh yes, and there's um there's a, a spirit of the princess called Anika, and she often uh, people say she tries to kill tourists." who spend too much time up there so be careful <laughs> it's like awesome stoked for that <laughs> anyway that's gonna and i i don't believe in ghosts but when you're when you're alone and it's like midnight uh, in an abandoned castle you start to believe in ghosts just a little bit you know a little bit so uh, anyway i just i just did that and there's been a lot more of these private adventures this year it's hard to go re visit remote tribes so much mm -hmm. I had some really fun stuff planned, but it's all, all changed. More festivals for this year that, that I was supposed to film that have all changed. So it's more um, it's it's more camping, more solo-y kind of uh, abandoned. I'm doing a lot more abandoned locations as well that are beautiful uh, abandoned castle in Poland, the biggest abandoned castle. It's like, oh my God, it's, it's incredible. Did that about a month ago. Um, and then if I do choose to do stuff with local people, we go get COVID tests. It's not required, but I just had an, uh, another COVID test this morning because we're going to be filming a bit more in the next few days. And 
it's just good to know. And I think what, I think if you do choose to travel, you don't have to do these things, but the worst thing you can do is track your dirty feet around and infect people that um, they don't have to, you know, that don't need to be that, that you're the reason that this thing gets moved around. And we've been traveling slower too. Uh, only again, three countries in three months for us or four months is is slow. Normally it's a country every two weeks or, or, or more. Like I had been to 11 countries before the end of February uh, this year. So that's normally the pace. It's like a bit of a whirlwind. So it's been nice to slow it down um, yeah. for two reasons. Number one, because it's just, it's, it's harder to travel quickly, but also I think it's more responsible to stick around and, and not uh, not run around so quickly. Yeah, or don't, don't sp spread around whatever you've got too much. But again, also yeah. if we get tested, we've gotten tested a few times now. So that's good. And 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 outside the filming, you, you you're doing um you've got an online course as well, haven't you? That, that that's coming out. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So I just launched a War on Fear boot camp, and it's again, uh, if you listen, I mean, if you're this far, you listen to the whole podcast. You know, my journey with fear has been an interesting one, and I really feel like I can speak better than anybody about fear because again i I've, I've i've walked the path man i've i've been in the dark and not that i'm completely bare face in the light now but i think i'm getting close to understanding how to navigate this uh this feeling that we're not instructed at all about where fear is like like a baby blanket like we we all have it when we're younger and then we're just expected to get rid of it um at some point when we grow up but we don't we all fear change i mean sure it's not the monster under the bed anymore but it's uh, it's still a real thing. It manifests itself in fear of inadequacy, fear of public speaking, fear of commitment, fear of like fear is something like jealousy is fear, prejudice is fear. All these things are still fear in, in different forms, adult versions, which are sometimes even more scary, right? So um, because I've chosen to dive headfirst in recklessly, let's say, against what my fear has told me, but at the same time, knowledgeably and to, with the proper training to be able to do some of these things that I thought were scary, um, I, I'm confident that I can help a lot of people. And that's why I launched the course, because I can make some videos here and there about it. But ultimately, I want to make a tool that if people do feel stuck, that I can help them. And that that's the war on fear boot camp. So if anyone's interested in that, it's actually just launching, uh, it's launching right now. And um, you'll you'll be able to find on on any of my social platforms. There'll be there'll be videos about it. It's um yeah the war on fear boot camp by fearless and far. Cool. And um, what's what's the easiest way for for people to follow what you're up to? And you know. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a video that goes live on YouTube about once a week. So, and that's been consistent for a long time now. So, YouTube is Phyllis and Far, and on mm -hmm. Instagram, I'm posting quite often as well stories and photos. Those are my two main platforms, and that's also Fearless and Far. And so, you can find me there. Just beware. Some, some, sometimes the videos are like I did something. I did leech therapy about a month and a half ago um, because I was scared of it. Because <laughs> leeches are gross, man. Uh, like, yeah. They're gross. <laughs> anyway, so, but it's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, like, the thing is my, my criteria is always like, is it, is it going to permanently hurt me? Okay, no. It, it, is it just scary because it's gross or I don't understand it? Yes. And so like, if I'm not going to be permanently disfigured and it's not going to be a bad thing, could I potentially grow or learn something from the experience? Potentially, sure. So we did it. And I've got a little scar on my belly because I apparently got my liver cleaned by two leeches. But hey, that's why I do it. Not not because it's always fun, but because I'm like, oh, I don't like. I'm gonna be fine. Like I'm gonna be fine. So let's let's jump into it. You know, that's cool. Awesome, man. It's been really <clears> good talking to you. And yeah, we'll we'll definitely keep an eye out and see what what, what other adventures you're up to later in the year. And yeah, all the best with it, dude. Yeah, he heading to uh, heading to Turkey in about a week and a half to do a show with BBC, and we'll be investigating Mad Honey hallucinogenic honey which apparently i thought was only in nepal but it's in turkey as well so yeah uh you can also find me on the bbc travel show um as well yeah awesome thanks mike thanks man nice to talk man you too